To the classroom. Mobile phones are as addictive as crack cocaine, says one head teacher who wants to ban them in school hours. I speak of Jane Lunnan, who is at Alain's school in Dulwich, in South London. Hmm. Says the type of pornographic material and the volume of images that children can access has changed significantly in the past decade. After the outpouring of testimonies on the anti-rape movement website Everyone's Invited and a report from Ofsted last week saying sexual abuse and harassment have been normalised among teenagers, many schools are introducing new initiatives. So to that school, uh, and Ms, what is it, Ms or Mrs Ms Lunn, uh, says this has been chastening and salutary. The discovery it was named on Everyone's Invited where pupils from hundreds of schools post his experiences of sexual harassment. It's a co-ed school. Uh, and I'm going to declare an interest here. Both my sons attended that school, and notwithstanding what might have happened, as part of everyone's invited, I have to say they had outstanding education with a fantastic set of teachers, uh, and it's a school that I've always thought uh, was almost like a trailblazer. But I'm not with minimising for a second uh, the importance of everyone's invited. OK, enough from me. Leon Hady is a former head teacher himself at a secondary school in Nottingham, now a teacher trainer, uh, advises international or governments internationally on teacher training. OK, let's back up a little, if we may, Mr Hady. How much of a potential menace is a mobile phone in the hands of a school pupil? Good morning. A very good morning to you. Yeah, it can be very problematic. There was a report a while ago that was put out that technology in the hands of teachers is excellent. Technology in the hands of students is actually no benefit to their learning unless it's well directed by a teacher. So essentially, you've given the child the world in their hand <laughs> and obviously they don't have the responsibility of the awareness to know what to do with it. What is the way to tame that then? How, how should it be managed, Mr Haley? Well, with a lot of things, I mean, I know this is going to be an extreme parallel, but I'll take you back to the opiate crisis or the cocaine crisis. Remember, we used to give people that as medicine back in the late 1800s, etc., mm. and in the early, early 1900s. And so we were doing something that we thought was good, and then later on we realised the damage of it. So I think we're going to see mobile phones in a similar way. I'm not going to say it's exactly the same, because essentially the unfettered access um, releases the same kind of um, actions in the brain in terms of your neurotransmitters and what's happening with the dopamine hits, and you're wearing down the receptors with the access of what you can actually see. So yeah, you're changing the complete well, structure of the brain, I guess, but also really you're changing the way that people interact with everything at every level through their phone, forgetting how to be able to talk to people, what physical contact is. And obviously in the, in the cases that you mentioned, and I did this at our school for, for, for reasons as well that are related, we banned mobile phones because it just was too, too much of a challenge to actually try and educate all the children in a school on this issue. It's just how easier to ban it during school time, have school control and school ideals during school time, yes. and then the parents are in charge of the rest. In practical terms, how did you take the appliances from the children? Um, it genuinely, in the first instance, we gave, we tried three different things. You may laugh at these, but they all worked to varying degrees, and mm. all three of them worked. Number one, we told the children that they were going to be banned, and if they were seen, they were to be confiscated. That was one. Number two, for the children that had real problems, and again, this is the part, we got pound shop phones for them, so they actually had something to pull out and look out, and they just had a joke with it. So they'd be Bart Simpson phones, Spider-Man phones, with some students that worked. And the third one... So what, we what, is it, this was secondary school, though? Sorry to talk over you, sir, but this was secondary school, was it? This was secondary school, Gosh. yeah, because... It becomes a joke. It becomes an ironic joke with the kids. You know, like okay. they, they laugh about which of those phones is, phones is coolest. Then remember that we have to explain to them why you're doing it. We're not doing it because we'd want to be draconian on you. We're doing it for different. But the most successful one for us was having a space in school where we said to all the children, we're going to charge and protect your phone all day. And so essentially we had a space within the school where we had dozens and dozens and dozens of phones handed in where people would then accept it as charged. Because then you actually see the children saw it as us helping you, not banning you from stuff, it changed the dynamic completely. Now, the first one, we didn't have to, inf the first of the three methods I mentioned there, the first one we stopped having to enforce because of the third one. The second one we stopped having to do, <laughs> apart from with all the most, um, uh, I don't say belligerent children, but the children who just thought it was funny by the end of the day, it wasn't a deterrent. <laughs> the third one when we said to the kids, we'll take your phones, we'll store them, we'll charge them. That made the biggest difference. And I understand that that's going to be difficult, you know, in schools of three, 4,000 people or colleges, but essentially we do have spaces where items are charged. And if you want to take care of the problem, you have to take action. It's not just about what you can tell children, it's about what you can physically manifest. The elephant in the classroom here is, was this pre or post pandemic you did this? Exactly. That's what I was saying to one of your colleagues earlier. Ah. It was definitely pre. So what's right. going to happen post pandemic? Because in children, in, in some instances, if they've been at home and mum and or dad doesn't have access uh, to a, a laptop, they might have been using them for learning now, of course, their phones. Yeah, there's a, that's, uh, the, the jury's out on that. Um, okay. I wouldn't assume. What impact will the pandemic be. have, do you think, on trying to uh, wean children from their, uh, from their mobile phones? 
Well, essentially, it's allowed them access in a level and a range that they haven't had before. So you are going to have a tougher time taking a phone off a child. And what you really need to do is actually start to educate on what's happening with their phone. At the moment, they think that what's happening with their phone is their access, their friends, their contacts. But they also have to be given the replacements to actually show them what, quote unquote, real or offline life was like and how that was beneficial for the body and the brain in a much, much more long term sense. Online, generally what you find with people, even adults, they're jumping. You're on a screen, you're just jumping between things. Very few people are developing the concentration to actually even read a complete book now. And with the, all the interactions, the notifications, the interest, and you see this from students, you know, a student will tell you, he's like, sir, I start off my phone in the morning. I've got 11 social media stuff, things. Within half an hour, nothing's happened on any of them. And then I just start the loop again. And, you know, they realize, a lot of students realize, like, this is not a good spend of my time. So we need to actually explain to them what the brain science is behind it, what the social science is behind it. And we can, we can help children actually overcome this. And lastly, do you uh, concur with the view it's addictive, it's almost as addictive as crack cocaine? Uh, you definitely, if you look at the brain, you can you see it's probably more addictive. You can look at what the effects that it has on the brain in certain instances. That's, that's just an unqualified yes. Okay, really enjoyed our conversation together. Leon Hady, thank you. You're a former head teacher at a secondary school in Nottingham. You're now a teacher, trainer and work internationally in that area.